Hello, this is Dr. Andy McLean talking with you today about um, resilience for direct care providers. So the objectives today are differentiating between stress and burnout, identifying tools for resilience for care providers, and identifying traits of resilient communities or, and organizations. We all uh, work within uh, some particular organization and so it's important to also look at the, the health of those as well. So with stress and burnout, one might consider stress as, as pressure on an individual and burnout as, as a depletion. And there can be a vicious cycle between these two, obviously. Um, and individual stress can result <clears throat> from pressure from varying sources. Burnout is seen as specific to one's occupation or one's workplace. Uh, it's so prevalent that the uh, World Health Organization has actually uh, declared it um, a syndrome resulting from chronic workplace stress that's not been successfully managed. So what you hear about is, is a lot of uh, emphasis on individuals doing what they should do to stay healthy. And clearly they need to do that. Uh, we all need to do that. But we also need to look at our system and make sure that it's healthy as well. So Christina Maslach uh, has talked about burnout within three different dimensions, uh, that people who experience burnout experience exhaustion, both physical, emotional, mental, um, cynicism, or, or some have called it a, a depersonalization where we remove ourselves, kind of protect ourselves from the, you know, caring for others. Uh, being empathic uh, is, uh, is a difficult thing. And we all wanna be empathic as care providers. And when we're burned out, that tends to uh, fade away. And then feeling as if we're just not doing the job we need to do, that we're not efficient in doing what we need to do to help our patients or clients. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> being empathic is not without risk. Uh, being a care provider is not without risk. And, and so there's um, different clusters that all kind of come together there. They have slight differences, but they're all very similar. Compassion fatigue, uh, where we kind of lose ourselves and our clients or patients, vicarious trauma, where we change how we see the world because of how we're constantly being bombarded with these stressors. Um, secondary traumatic stress, similar to PTSD. And then, as I mentioned, burnout with the exhaustion. We all know typical signs of stress. We've all experienced them. Uh, these are kind of normal responses to abnormal situations. Um, moody, tired, sleep problems, uh, anxious, and, and seeing the world more negatively. And we also can have other cognitive problems, trouble concentrating, um, thinking clearly, clearly, et cetera. Unfortunately, many of us will have um, maladaptive coping skills, uh, relying on uh, substances to quote unquote self-medicate, get us to sleep, um, you know, not uh, taking care of ourselves, um, e e not eating well, not exercising, um, falling back on old bad habits. So when we talk about resilience, uh, we look at both individual and community resilience. And individual resilience is the ability to adapt to adversity, capacity to cope, and potential for change and growth. There's something called post-traumatic growth in which people can come out the other end actually better we look at uh, resilient communities, Betty Pfefferbaum's group has looked at this, with the ability of community members to take meaningful, deliberate, collective action to remedy the impact of a problem, <clears throat> including the ability to interpret the environment and move on. So you'll see that both of these things are intentional, they're action oriented, they're not passive, not sitting back, they're actually doing something to stay healthy. So resilient attitudes from one of my colleagues who does a lot of this type of work, uh, Kit O'Neill, viewing change as a challenge or an opportunity, thinking realistically, keeping things in perspective, not to minimize our own pain, but also to look at the world as in general and say, um, you know, based on other people's experiences, how is mine compared to theirs? And then setting goals and planning action steps, like I mentioned, being intentional. Uh, during crises or during particularly difficult times, there are, are resilient behaviors that can be fairly simple, um, you know, to, to remind oneself, uh, making sure you're getting adequate rest, <clears throat> making sure that you're following through with routines, 
whether it's reading your kids' bedtime stories, having a meal with the family, doing those sorts of things that ground you um, and, and making sure that you're able to do that, and then maintaining relationships. And that's going to be the key throughout this, that, that probably the most important glue in terms of staying resilient is actually maintaining connectedness. So looking at things, you know, what is it in our lives that, uh, that sustains us and what, what depletes us? And also looking from a perspective standpoint as to, you know, what's temporary, a temporary stressor that we know we can perceive the end and what's, you know, kind of chronic and, and protracted and, and pervasive. Um, there was somebody who said, you know, you can, you can run a marathon or you can, you know, uh, run a sprint, but you can't sprint a marathon. And so keeping that in perspective and looking at things we can control. We can't control what others do. We can't control our employers per se. We can't control whether the store has toilet paper. And we all remember that at the start of the pandemic. Um, we can't control the future beyond what actions we can do uh, to try to set our own course. But we do have lots of choices. We can uh, make a difference and, and choose how our attitude is going to be, how we're going to treat other people, interact with other people, how we're going to prioritize things. We can certainly limit um, the input of things that aren't healthy to us, particularly, you know, some of the things in terms of social media exposure, you know, being able to set limits and, um, you know, make our own decisions. One of the protective factors we've found with uh, resilience is Finding that part of um, your job that uh, captured the essence of why you went into the field. Sometimes it's easy to find that in a, you know, a, a grateful family member or, you know, a patient. Other times we have to go looking for it. But, but finding that little spark that tells you, yeah, this is why I went into the, to, to the field. Um, of all the variables in terms of individual resilience, two of the most impactful have to do with resources, you know, having the ability to do what we need to do. That's not always been available in those during the pandemic, certainly experienced that. And there can be something called moral distress or moral injury when we're not able to provide uh, the care that we know we should based on the lack of resources or the circumstances. The other variable that can be most impactful is social connectedness. And this we do have more control over. Certainly when there are disasters or crises where we're less able to communicate with others, that can be a bit more difficult. But usually maintaining social connectedness is within the realm of what we can do. And, and that's very powerful and, and, and very necessary. When we look at successful, successfully resilient communities, and you can think of uh, how many communities you actually are involved in. It may be, you know, family, church, civic, work, etc. But when we look at uh, traits across those, those communities that are resilient have strong leadership. They're able to engage their members well. They use resources wisely and they attend to psychosocial issues. So in various communities, you may be a leader in one community, you may be a follower in another and, and different roles, but we wanna think about those uh, common traits. Also resilient uh, organizations um, have a number of traits. A common theme is, is that of clarity, even in the midst of a crisis, people know what the mission is, what they need to do. There are guiding principles there. There are acceptable practices that everybody knows about. And, and so there are commonalities uh, in terms of those, uh, those issues. So uh, elements of, of transformational culture, uh, when uh, groups are moving into more uh, resilient and, um, and healthier uh, cultures, there are shared values. There's a sense of empowerment uh, there's good communication. There's the expectation that we will continue to serve with excellence. And there are rewards for success. And oftentimes those rewards aren't necessarily monetary, but, but people recognize others for their efforts. I'm gonna um, mention the facts here. So when um, we started doing disaster mental health work um, around the upper Midwest floods, we looked at what the standard of care was, what the evidence showed, and we made an acronym uh, called the FACTS. And it stands for foster hope, act with purpose, connect with others, take care of yourself, 
and search for meaning. And the search for meaning doesn't necessarily have to be anything, you know, spiritual or religious. It certainly can be, but but looking at the situation and say, what does this mean for me? Um, how does this uh, look for me going forward? Uh, many people have made decisions in their lives based on recent crises, based on the pandemic. Um, you know, for some, it's just been very affirming as to the direction that they've been going in their careers. So um, the facts can be helpful in grounding you uh, during these crises. And that's the end of this presentation. I appreciate the opportunity to have uh, presented to you. Thanks.